I want you to hit me as hard as you can. It was 33 years ago when Eddie Murphy certified his status as a king of comedy by playing the prince of an African nation who went looking for a queen in Queens in the comedic classic Coming to America. And now that Eddie has finally made another comeback with Dolomite Is My Name, the time is right for Prince Akeem of Zamunda to once again return to New York in search of his long lost son, as Amazon presents the long awaited sequel Coming to America. With not only Arsenio Hall reuniting with Eddie behind the prosthetic makeup, but Eddie re-teaming with his Dolomite director Craig Brewer and co-star Wesley Snipes, which will hopefully help the sequel continue Eddie Murphy's career resurgence instead of crashing it in another Norbit-style flameout. But for those of you who are wondering why the director of the original Coming to America, John Landis, isn't returning to helm the sequel, then let me remind you. By looking back at Landis's last and worst collaboration with Eddie Murphy in the 1994 Cop Out sequel, Beverly Hills Cop 3. Although Eddie had already proved his star power with 48 Hours and Trading Places, it was his role as Axel Foley in Beverly Hills Cop that made the SNL star a bona fide leading man. As his fast-paced wisecracks turned what was originally written as a serious action vehicle for Sylvester Stallone into one of the funniest and biggest movies of the decade. And although its sequel was nearly as big at the box office, both the critics and Eddie Murphy wrote it off as a mediocre rehash of its predecessor. So Murphy insisted that Axel's third trip to Beverly Hills would be a vast improvement, now that he was back with his Trading Places and Coming to America director, John Landis, who himself was also in need of a serious career boost. Unfortunately, neither Murphy or Landis succeeded in bringing Axel Foley back for the 90s, as the third Beverly Hills Cop failed to shake down the box office or have critics doing the Neutron Dance. With Murphy later admitting it was an atrocious disgrace that resulted in the Axel character being banished from Hollywood. Beverly Hills Cop 3. No, no, no. Wasn't a very good Beverly Hills Cop. <laughs> but with Eddie now playing to launch the long-delayed Beverly Hills Cop 4 at Netflix, let us discover how Axel's final adventure stuck a banana in the franchise's tailpipe. I mean, Eddie could have at least offered John Landis the chance to come back for coming to America, after how well John handled his last sequel with Blues Brothers 2000. Come on, man, who wouldn't want to have seen sexual chocolate turning into voodoo zombies? Aside from nobody. Shit the chocolate! But first, let us play a game that will leave you feeling both delirious and raw, as we pat it all the time, with another round of the awfully good drinking game. Take a shot or drink when someone else gets shot down in an action sequence, as we once again begin with Axel Foley in his native territory of Detroit, Michigan, where he and his fellow officers plan a late night bust on a garage full of car thieves and informs his cantankerous chief from the last two films, Inspector Todd, that they'll be doing this bust themselves without the help of a SWAT team. I wouldn't raid a church bingo game without SWAT. I think we can handle this. We don't need SWAT coming in here and blowing holes in all my evidence. This is your operation. I'm just an observer. Well, just observe how I don't have to use SWAT and trust me on this one, okay? Oh, Axel, you little scamp. You know I can't get mad at you when you flash me those pearly whites of yours. We cut to the aforementioned garage, where we find the car thieves singing and dancing Dancing along with a supreme song on the radio. Sing about me. Just sing about me. I guess that Detroit's car thief community happens to be huge fans of the Big Chill, and they're visited by a mysterious group of thugs led by a Robert Stack lookalike, for whom they've stolen a van full of crates meant for the U.S. government. Yes! 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 And right after the thugs pay back the car thieves by ridding their bodies with bullets, Axel knocks on the garage door, posing as a customer. Oh, uh, how you doing? Is this the illegal chop shop? One of them illegal places where they chop up cars? Yes! And his team proceeds to bust into the chop shop, only to find the car thieves dead and the gunmen trying to kill them as well. Oh, you said they had no guns. They must have changed their worldview. We should have called SWAT. I'm comforted to know that Eddie Murphy is just as unsure as I am as to whether or not that was actually supposed to have been a joke. 
When Inspector Todd arrives onto the scene to assist against the bad guys, the lead thug pops up and shoots him in the chest, and Axel arrives to find his chief is on the brink of death. No! Yes! Axel, you're on a coffee break. Go get that son of a bitch. Um, Eddie, your beloved boss has just died. Can you muster up some sort of emotion for this scene? Hello? We're paying you $15 million for this movie. Hey, boss. Hey, man. Hey! Ah, good. That did the trick. Jeez, man, the least you could do is scream towards the sky in fury. <laughs> Axel chases down the thugs in a disassembled sports car that falls apart piece by piece during the chase. Damn your shoddy car manufacturing, Elon Musk! But he's unfortunately stopped by a secret service agent named Steve Fulbright, who claims that he is tracking down the thugs for a federal investigation. The fucking guy in the truck just shot a Detroit police officer! It's very important he not be apprehended at this time. I'm sure that the mysterious federal agent who looks like Lance Henriksen is totally telling the truth about his good intentions. So after Axel attends Todd's funeral that's overseen by the Reverend Al Green, since I presume the Reverend James Brown was busy with a better John Landis movie, he's informed that the thug's stolen van traces back to an amusement park called Wonderworld, which is located in, where else, Beverly Hills, California. I understand that you were with him at the end. Yeah, his last words were about you. Try again. Actually, his last words were, Axel, are you on a coffee break? Go and get that son of a bitch. What a coincidence that this is the third time in a row that Axel has tracked down one of his friend's murderers to Beverly Hills. But I guess that's why they call him Beverly Hills Cop and not Bemidji, Minnesota Cop. Although that movie may have done better at the box office than Metro did. Now with Axel returning to Beverly Hills to again seek the assistance of its police department, who else should he reconnect with but his doofy police pal, Billy Rosewood, once again played by the Honorable Judge Reinhold, who in the seven years since he last saw Axel has been promoted as the Deputy Director of the Command Center that helps the department track crime in the Beverly Hills area. I'm DDOJSIOC. The JG Jojo C. William Rosewood, DDO, JSIOC. So I coordinated with the SMPD, BHPD, LAPD. And no, this joke does not go anywhere, and neither is it funny. And with Billy now partnered with Detective John Flint, played by Hector Elizondo, you may be wondering what happened to Billy's previous partner, John Taggart, or their captain, Andrew Bogomil. Taggart, where is he? I'd love to say hello to him. Taggart's retired. Spends his days lost in the woods looking for his golf balls. In other words, John Ashton and Ronnie Cox read the script for Beverly Hills Cop 3 and said, Hell to the naw! So let this photo on Billy's desk serve as a tribute to them jumping off this sinking franchise while they still could. Now Axel is off to Wonderworld to begin his investigation, where he's forced to pay admission to see the park's head of security. Well, how much is a ticket? $35. $35? Oh boy, I'm sure that Axel's gonna pull one of his signature fast-talking scams on these people so he can enter the park for free. One, please. Uh, wait, he just pays for the ticket without incident? You know, you, you should have your tailor cut the jacket a little wider than the chest, that way your gun won't bulge in the back. And the best joke he can come up with is towards a security guard's jacket? This is not how comedy works! I do not watch Eddie Murphy movies to see him immediately cave in to society's will. Next, we find Axel being shown the inner workings of the park by his future love interest of the film, Janice Perkins, played by Teresa Randall, aka Teresa Burnett from the Bad Boys movies. After which, the park security guards open fire on the officer, and Axel runs off onto one of the park's rides. And since it would not be a John Landis movie without some cameos from Landis's fellow movie directors, we have an appearance from George Goddamn Lucas as a park patron who's shoved out of the way by Axel. Come on, let's go. Come on, sweetie, let's head over to Galaxy's Edge so I can bitterly complain about the new Star Wars movies with the park's entertainers. Yeah, but I'm glad you fired that Gina Carano. I knew she was no good. Boy, her acting made Jake Lloyd look like Alec Guinness. Uh, hey, I'm not boring you, am I? Yeah, you are. When the security guards try bringing Axel down and break the ride's control panel, the ride begins to do some twists and turns which imperils the lives of two children. And Axel must hop out to save their lives in what is admittedly the film's most exciting action sequence. Even if the people watching below don't seem terribly excited about it, and you can easily see Eddie is on a green screen while his stuntman does all the heavy lifting. I don't know, maybe it's just because seeing two kids in peril in a John Landis movie automatically puts me on edge. <laughs> Look, I'm trying not to be insensitive, okay? You know you were thinking about it too. Now hold on tight. <laughs> 
Give me your hand. Come on, stop it. No, 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 no. Give me your hand. It's okay. Oh, please. You expect me to believe that Axel can rappel down that rope without severe burns to both of his hands? That's the most unbelievable thing I've seen in this movie. <laughs> okay, I stand corrected. The second most unbelievable thing I've seen in this movie. So Axel is chewed out for his reckless behavior by the park's manager, Oren Sanderson, played by recently departed acting legend John Saxon, where we discover that the park's head of security, Ellis DeWald, is the man who killed Inspector Todd. This fucking guy shot a Detroit police officer last weekend! I was at my beach house in Laguna last weekend. With his security team editing the surveillance footage to make Axel look solely responsible for the mayhem. The tapes don't show your gunman. He risked his life to save two children. Yeah, don't show that shit. Well, that would be very impressive if we knew for sure you didn't cause the malfunction in the first place. Oh, sure. It's not like you could ask the hundreds of people who clearly saw your security guards breaking the ride's control panel. First, you don't believe your daughter about Freddy Krueger, and now this. But Axel insists that he'll prove DeWald was the man who murdered Todd with help from the owner of Wonderworld, Uncle Dave Thornton, with Uncle Dave being played by the original Uncle Scrooge, Alan Young. At Wonderworld, it's a place of childhood innocence and fun. And life and death. One of the many clever nods they make to Disney with this fictional Disneyland stand-in, along with the Wonder World theme song being written by longtime Disney songwriters, the Sherman Brothers. Unfortunately, none of this cleverness applies to Eddie Murphy's dialogue, as John Landis has said that he thought Eddie would improve the subpar script by adding his improvised wisecracks, much like he did with the first Beverly Hills Cop only to have Eddie insist that Axel Foley had become an adult by this point, who was no longer a wise-ass. And when you have Eddie Murphy sticking to the script as written, you negate the entire appeal of the Axel Foley character, that he's crazy and spontaneous and doesn't play by the book. For example, watch this scene where Axel comes to a security conference to confront DeWalt where he once again crosses paths with Serge, the flamboyant foreigner he met at the art gallery in the first movie, once again played by Bronson Pinchot. Serge. 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 Now the rapport between these two was a highlight of the first movie, and their few moments together stopped right before the humor lost its flavor. But this time around, Eddie contributes little to their conversation other than an occasional bout of mugging for the camera, while Bronson Pinchot is forced to carry the scene all by himself by cranking his cousin Balky accent shtick all the way up to 11 for what feels like an eternity. It looked like a keychain, but it's so much more. This is called a stunt. Yeah, okay, very serious individual. I never see him smile. Also, I never see him in a pair of pants. Okay, I'm just going to, to push this button, okay? And he says, okay. And then you put the dice for your camera. Out comes from the mechanism. So ride it, blinding like hell. Wow, that's cool. Now I'm going to show you something that is going to totally blow your rocks. Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> oh, good. Now Axel's pulling a Kanye West on Ellis DeWald as he's accepting a Man of the Year award. Surely this scene will motivate Eddie to finally say something funny. It is a tremendous surprise for Mr. DeWall to have me standing right next to him right now. You know, right now I can feel his body tingling. Nope, not even so much as a chuckle. This scene feels more like what Eddie really wanted to do when Alan Arkin beat him for the Oscar. Look, I'm sorry I did know it, okay? But y'all know I was supposed to get this award before that movie came out. So come on, Alan Arkin, why don't you be a gentleman and just give Eddie his Oscar, huh? Fuck you, Gumby. I won this award fair and square. That's it, I'm gonna kick your well ass. I ain't waiting another 10 years for a comeback on Netflix. Give him my Oscar, you motherfucker. When we return, a special performance from Dolly Parton next on the Oscars. I'm gonna beat you worse than Rick James beat my brother Charlie. But Eddie's tired performance can also be attributed to the off-screen depression that Bronson Pinchot said Murphy was going through during production after a string of underwhelming disappointments in his career. And this movie is one of the most underwhelming of them all, despite having a script from 48 Hours and Die Hard writer Stephen E. D'Souza, who in the same year as his terrible Street Fighter movie also gives us the sight of Axel Foley having to sneak past the security guards while dressed up in an elephant costume. Probably the saddest fate for a once cool action hero since James Bond dressed up as a clown. Hey, Oki, do the Oki shuffle. Okie dokie, okie dokie. That's not right. I'm okie dokie and I changed the steps. You got a problem with that? 
Oh, oh, you let him go and fuck him. If this movie wants to suddenly turn into a live action remake of Bebe's Kids, then I'm frankly quite alright with that. But after Axel's brief sojourn at a furry convention, he comes across the secret counterfeit money ring that Ellis DeWald is running underneath the family fun park, leading to yet another chase between Axel and security, where the park's customers don't seem to notice a glass phone booth shattering or the guards showing their guns out in broad daylight, but collectively cower in fear when Axel shoots up into the air to recreate his favorite scene from Point Break. When Agent Fulbright and Detective Flint arrive to again yell at Axel for his loose cannon tactics, he prepares to show them the counterfeit money machine that DeWald and Sanderson are running under the park. Man, this place is as high-tech as NASA and Nintendo can find. What on earth is this maniac raving about? Only to have them claim the machine is actually for printing funny money to be used as Wonder World currency. We're calling them Wonder World dollars. We're giving it away to elementary schools all across the country. Man, whoever they commissioned to draw Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill really did a piss-poor job. Axel once again runs out of the grasp of DeWald's security team and meets with Uncle Dave to tell him what's going down at his park, only for DeWald and his goons to track Axel back down so they can frame him for the murder of Uncle Dave. I actually was a real cop once, so I know how you assholes think. Great. It wasn't enough for them to make Axel Foley unfunny, they had to make him shit stupid at police work too. Of course DeWald knew you were gonna go run off to blab to the owner of the park, you stupid silly ass. And after getting Uncle Dave to the hospital, Axel finds himself in a pickle when the news announces Uncle Dave is in grave condition, with Axel being sought by the police as his suspected assassin. Axel, I am your friend. But you've got to turn yourself in, man. You hear some black guy shot Uncle Dave? No. Oh, Eddie needs to hide his face from the cops. Time to give those SNL makeup artists another call. <laughs> No, actually, Axel has to return to the park after DeWald tells him they're holding Janice hostage in exchange for the mint paper that Axel has as evidence, and returns to Surge to obtain the weapon he was selling at the security convention, the Annihilator 2000, which is sold with a pretty funny commercial, which feels like something John Landis left out of Kentucky Fried Movie. A compact disc player, digital AM, FM radio, video camera are just a few of the features of the extraordinary Annihilator 2000. When you absolutely, positively got to kill every motherfucker in the room, except no substitutes. But since Axel can't sneak this big fucking gun past the security guards, he takes on DeWald with another one of Surge's inventions. A keychain that blinds criminals with a blast of light. Because Surge is now this franchise's equivalent of Q, I guess. Billy and Janice help Axel fight off the bad guys before they get locked inside of Mr. Freeze's man cave. While Axel takes on the approaching guards with the Annihilator gun in one of the few jokes of this film, which actually pays off. Gangsaline, I got green, what we call my red. North Dakota, South Dakota, Illinois. Now, if Eddie really wanted to take down these goons, he would be playing his duet with Michael Jackson on that gun stereo system. <laughs> the film brightens up even further as Axel fights off more guards at a ride called Alien Attack, which involves a subway coming under attack from leftover Cylon robots off the original Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> Somebody put me out! Ah, that wasn't a fire extinguisher! It feels good to see a flicker of the old Axel Foley return as we see him manipulating a dead guard's body like a puppet, or telling off John Saxon by printing his face through the money machine. Ah! Oh, I hate that Axel Foley! So with Billy and Janice free from the security room, and Hector Elizondo looking to shoot his agent for casting him in that god-awful autism musical, Axel arrives in Jurassic World for his final face-off against Ellis DeWald. <laughs> well, Axel, you want to at least try shooting off a cool death quip? No, of course not. We need to reveal the big twist with Agent Fulbright that we saw coming from his very first scene. You know, I found out about another partner that was in on it. So long, Foley. It was Agent Fulbright all along! And for those of you wondering why Axel hasn't let out his signature laugh yet, <laughs> not to worry, he was saving it for the very end of the movie. He needs medical attention. <laughs> 
this hurt? <laughs> Don't touch it. <laughs> it's totally not worth the wait. So Uncle Dave somehow survives his gunshot to the belly and holds a ceremony in honor of the hero cop who saved his life and amusement park. A new character in Wonder World. <laughs> Fox. And this, my friends, is how the Beverly Hills Cop series ends. Not with a bang, but with Axel Foley becoming a cartoon fox. Better than a cartoon donkey, I guess. You know, this movie was a lot like playing the Universal Studios video game for the GameCube. You spent most of the time dealing with garbage at an amusement park while having all too brief moments of fun with the park's attractions, ending with an underwhelming celebration, after which you angrily throw the disc through your window! Hey! Beverly Hills Cop 3 is the only film in the series to not be produced by Don Simpson and Jerry Bruckheimer, or scored by Harold Faltermeyer, with soul music legend Nile Rodgers handling the soundtrack here, and coming up with some new takes on the franchise's famous Axel F theme. Which button for Billy Rosewood? <laughs> All of which are at least better than the Crazy Frog version of Axel F. And without Bruckheimer around to liven things up with his coke fiend energy, the third film is a joyless run through of all the cop movie cliches that Beverly Hills Cop helped popularize in the first place, with no help from Eddie Murphy's checked out performance or John Landis's competent yet surprisingly dull direction. So with Bruckheimer attached to the new Beverly Hills Cop, along with the directors of Bad Boys for Life, we can only hope that Axel Foley's fourth adventure will be a marked improvement over his last one, which will leave its viewers wishing that Eddie had made yet another 48 hours instead. But if I can say one nice thing, it's that neither Beverly Hills Cop 3 or Blues Brothers 2000 can be counted as the worst thing ever made by John Landis. Get the fuck out of here! <laughs> On the enjoyableness continuum scale from Bull to Bruce, Beverly Hills Cop 3 is the rare case that Paul Reiser made a better career decision than Eddie Murphy did, and hands in its badge and gun for a permanent suspension of 3 out of 10. This movie is not very funny, funny motherfucker, motherfucker, nor is it okay. okay. I'm Jesse Shade for JoeBlow.com, and thanks again for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to the Joe Blow Videos channel. Tell all your friends who like this sort of content, and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We are an independent company that appreciates all of your support. Oh, and did I forget to mention the Beverly Hills Cop pilot from 2013 that had a cameo from Eddie Murphy with the lead role of Axel Foley's son, played by Brandon T. Jackson? Wonder World, Wonder World, fantasies come true, it's a happy world.